just want to welcome you to Invisible Women in Sports. And this is the kickoff panel for the National Consortium of Academics and Sports. We're going to do a series of panels, conferences, workshops, or symposiums throughout this year. So we want you guys to look forward to that. Stay um, attended with us on our Twitter and on our Facebook so you can get the announcements and the updates for that, okay? Now, a few house rules, okay? We are taping this live, and this is on our live Facebook um, page right now. And so we want you all to make sure that you participate by tweeting while we're in the conference um, and use your social media, okay? Please use has hashtag invisible women in sport, okay? So, this is not about me. I've been up here long enough already. This is about these, these women here today, these women that are in leadership positions in sport, and so we want to get to them as quickly as possible. So, we have the privilege of having two DeVos graduate students going to moderate our session today. And I'm proud to say that they will be graduating here in a few short weeks. So, so I'm going to turn it over to them. Um, we have Kirsten Newendon and we have Dewan Baker, who's going to moderate for us today. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to be a part of this great initiative. I am from Paramaribo, Suriname. I graduated from the University of Central Florida with a degree in interdisciplinary studies and a minor in function. I have a graduate assistantship with the Institute for Adversity and Ethics in Sports, and upon completion of the program, I aspire to start a career in student athlete welfare development. Thank you. Hello. 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 Uh, from St. Louis, Missouri, graduated from the University of Missouri in 2015. Uh, here in DeVos, I'm currently a graduate assistant with the Institute for Diversity and Ethics Sport with Kirsten. And also, like Kirsten, uh, following the program, I'd like to pursue a career in student athlete welfare development as well. Uh, but just kind of to allude to some of the things that Brian said, uh, again, the name of the discussion of the panel is uh, Invisible Women in Sport. Please hashtag it, Twitter, Facebook, blogs, anything you can. But we really just want to take the time to kind of recognize the women on our panel for their accomplishments and kind of address the problem that, uh, you know, women in sport, uh, specifically women of color in sport, um, are not very, not very wide in the industry, they're very spread thin. So we're going to take the time today to really talk to these women and get to learn their stories and get to learn what it is that made them different, some things that they could have done better, and uh, how their outlook on the industry as a whole, and see that uh, things that we can do as advocates, uh, as people who enter in sport industry. Going forward, we're going to have some activities for you all with the DeVos students uh, before we get into everything with the panel. But I'm going to take the time to bring up uh, Mr. Perry Howell and Ms. Sable Lee, who are also DeVos students, and have activities for you all. Minority 
including those comprise less than 7% of the population of athletics professionals at NCAA member institutions in all three divisions. Uh, true or false? So we'll give you, um, you know, a quick second to, to text your responses. I know a lot of you have already uh, submitted your answers.
table me. Um, I graduated from Jacksonville University. I am a new to law student here at the University of Central Florida, where I'm the graduate assistant for Dr. Mike Redwick. Um, today, Craig and I will be talking to you about the Invisible Women in Sport, celebrating the accomplishments of women in sport while um, uh, recognizing the, and challenging the current status quo. Association, the NBA. The 2016 NBA statistics 
Um, for team vice presidents, as you can see, 31% of team vice presidents are women of color, 68.82% are white women. And when we move over to league offices, league office vice president, 19% are women of color. But what I want to also point out to you guys again, if you go back to NFL, while league office vice presidents are more women of color in league office vice presidents within the NFL are more progressive, the NBA is still the less progressive um, uh, graph here is still more progressive than the NFL. So um, we can see the difference between leagues um, and where they are within their league offices and their, and their leadership positions for women of color. Um, and so we thank you for um, participating in our exercise. We hope you enjoyed the questions. Um, and these, these numbers are very alarming. Uh, there is a big glass ceiling where women want to, women of color want to be and their access to where they want to be. So I hope that this was a good lead into our panel today and our discussion today. Thank you. For our open, sorry, for our open remarks, we welcome Dr. Richard Fletcher. Discussion, the one I will give a brief introduction of the panelists, their long list of accomplishments. To start us off, I have Ms. Brandy Stewart. Brandy joined the UCF team in 2015 as senior women administrator for student at New Auburn Development. She also oversees the sports and medicine and strength and conditioning program, a softball standout in college. She was a member of the 2015 induction class of the Florida State University Hall of Fame. She also served some time at the California Interscholastic Federation, three years at Florida State University, and some time at the University of Alabama. She's also a consultant and facilitator for the National Consortium for Academics and Sport, where she is a mentor and violence prevention program coordinator. She graduated from the University of Florida State University with a degree in communication studies. Please help me welcome Ms. Brandy.
Um, so my dad and I spent a lot of time together, and he became the foundation of who I am and what I do and, and what I believe in in terms of how people um, can relate to each other, coach each other up, and be there for each other in a support and serving role. Um, you know, he is the person who taught me how to advocate for myself and advocate for others. He is the person that taught me that no matter what happens in life, you always do the right thing. Whether you win or you lose, integrity is always the most important part of who you are as a person and it is the, the first part of your character that people are going to see. Um, they still hold true to their values today, which of course obviously contributes to who me and my sister are as, as young women. Um, so that kind of brings me to um, my time at FSU. Uh, so I played softball, wound up going to Florida State to play softball, um, decided I wanted to get across the country to be able to be my own person, and that if anybody from my family was going to come visit me, they were going to have to call first. So um, no surprise visits, no pop-up visits in Tallahassee for my friends and family. Um, in my time there, I learned who I really was as a person. I really gained a greater appreciation for the foundation that my parents set. Uh, for me in terms of knowing who I was, knowing what I wasn't willing to compromise as an athlete, as a person, um, just in, in general, as a young woman. Um, I always had male coaches growing up. We always had the dads that were coaching us. So for me, it was an empowering piece as a young woman to have men who empowered us to be strong, be individuals, and succeed, right? You have all of these dads, all of these men who are teaching these young women how to win. And so that was a part of um, my nature when I got to FSU. Um, probably to the chagrin of my coaches at the time. Uh, I was very outspoken, and um, that wasn't necessarily a good fit for my head coach and myself. Uh, so we didn't always see eye to eye. And this is where my start in athletic administration and interest in athletic administration was born. Um, because she and I didn't always see eye to eye, I had to find something else that was going to, um, you know, fill my cup as a young person. And so I met a woman by the name of Pam Overton. Uh, she was our senior associate athletics director at the time. She was our student services. She was our SWA. And she took me in. She taught me about student services programming. She taught me about our student athlete advisory committee. Um, and she just taught me in general that there's much more to a collegiate athlete experience other than just playing your sport. And so that then broadened my horizon about the reach that all of us have um, to be able to touch the lives of other people. So, um, you know, as I was sitting here preparing for this and I was going through my mentors and thinking about the people who made a difference in my life, very interestingly, um, the first woman of color that I met who uh, served as a mentor for me was my administrative assistant in my first job at the ACC. Her name is Jenny Barrett, and she is an unforgettable woman. Um, she's since retired from the ACC, but she set me on my path as a professional and as an administrator in terms of asking for what I was worth. Uh, I remember meeting her when I was on my um, on my job interview, and then I came back uh, and, and I took the job, obviously, at the ACC. And so I'll never forget, she asked me, so what did you land on in terms of your salary? And I kind of looked at her and I said, what I asked you what I was just supposed to ask that. Um, but I took it for what it was worth, and we had a conversation, and she said very flippantly, you know, you could have got more than that. And you know you're worth more than that. At the time, I was 24. I didn't know any better. I was just happy somebody was going to give me a job. But she taught me my first lesson in knowing what you're worth and being willing to say that out loud to the people who are hiring you. Uh, so, so she was my uh, first teacher professionally, um, and she was my first, uh, I shouldn't say my first teacher professionally, but she was my first um, mentor of color and the first woman of color that I met throughout my six years at FSU and my undergraduate and graduate degree. She was the first, and I hadn't thought about that until getting prepared for this today, which is very interesting. Um, but I'm gonna go back to Florida State real quick. So 
Uh, and the young student athletes, they were really great in empowering us to advocate for ourselves and speak on behalf of who we are. And um, I had this handful of older, middle-aged white folks who were trying to teach me how to be an administrator. I didn't know why, I didn't understand it at the time, but now I really appreciate that they took the time to teach me what they knew. They took the time to pour into me all of the, the values and the skills and all of the necessary tools it was going to take to be an administrator in a collegiate athletics. And I remember them telling me, someday you're gonna have to do what we do and give back to people who look like you. And at the time, it didn't mean a whole lot to me. I was a student athlete, I didn't really know any better. I'm like, okay, you know, I'll give that to softball players, I'll give that to women, that sounds great. But sitting in this position now is that much more that those folks took the time to, to teach me how to be an administrator and to put me in a position to succeed. Um, so, you know, I, I really thank Pam and Kim Record, who's the athletic director at University of Greensboro, and Dave Hart, who's retiring from the University of Tennessee, and Bob Menix, who's a senior associate athletics director at Washington State University now. I mean, those were the people at Florida State who became my village and who uh, charged me with going out to the world and making a difference and doing it in a positive way. Um, as I continue to move forward, uh, I, again, I started at the ACC. I was fortunate enough to have Jenny by my side, she made sure that I was good in everything that we needed to do. I was always prepared. Anytime we were going into a meeting, if my boss at the time had given me a heads up about something, she always made sure that I knew who was going to be in the room and that I knew what was going to be expected of me. I was a you know, 24 year old young woman who was green as, you know, as anything. And she wanted to make sure that I was succeeding too because as my administrative assistant, she knew that it was important that when I went into that room, people knew that I had to be at the table and that I wasn't a graduate assistant and I wasn't an intern in the office, but that I was, I was a speaking member within that organization. So I thank her a lot for all of her support and, and lending me her shoulders to stand on. Um, I was fortunate enough to also meet a young man who now I get to work with again in Eric Wood. Um, Eric, it was a mentor for me like nobody's business. We would spend many a times for him reminding me and showing me how to be a professional and that I can't always speak my mind in the way that comes to me immediately, that uh, I have to have a filter, that I have to be able to be constructive and productive in how I handle my business because what I did at the ACC was going to impact what somebody else was gonna be able to do once I left. And so he was one of the first people to remind me that we have a greater obligation to continue to open doors for others and open our minds and the eyes of the people that we were working with to reinforce that people of color and young people of color can get the job done. And so that was something that I learned from Eric. I continue to really enjoy our time here together at UCF. Um, but he's someone who has really made a difference and served as a mentor for me along the way as well. Um, in addition to, to those folks, you know, throughout my time at Alabama and went back to Florida State and, um, you know, spent some time in the high school ranks and then now here, I think it's really important to share that along the way you always try to make sure, I always try to make sure that I leave whatever it is that I was doing, whatever organization I was belonging to, in a better place than it was in when I got there. That there's some type of memorable program or experience that the people that I worked with um, can say, you know, she did a really great job, so we can open up the door and we're not scared to hire anyone else who's young or another minority or another female. Um, so, you know, it's really, really important that anytime I meet folks that when they leave, they leave me, they don't see a young person, they're not impressed because I'm young or I speak well or I'm so educated or I've, I've had a lot of experience, but they just see me as a peer. They see me as a person who's got something to contribute to the work that we do. So, um, you know, I'm trying to get through here before my 15 minutes is up. Uh, in terms of networking, 
you know, I think it's really important, obviously, to get out and, and spread your wings and, and branch out a little bit. Um, again, as I was coming up and, and I'm preparing for this, I realized how few women of color I met early in my career. Um, I wound up having an opportunity to work uh, with some folks at the NACWA HERS, which is now called something different, uh, but at NACWA HERS Institute. And that's where I first met a sea of young women and young administrators who were also aspiring to be higher level administrators and not a HUD directors one day. And so, you know, whenever you can put yourself in a room full of people who don't look like you, um, whether they're women, whether they're men, minorities, whoever it is, always try to expand your mind and your network. You don't always have to network with people of color. You don't always have to network with white men because they, you know, seem to be the majority of the athletic directors. Make sure that you have a diverse group of people that you're working with but always, always give yourself an opportunity to talk with those who are also aspiring to do what you do. So the NACWA HERS group, they taught me a lot about making sure that we look out for each other, that we don't limit our goals, we don't limit our aspirations, and if ever we hear one of our peers doing that, to challenge them to think outside of that box, to not believe the hype, not believe the narrative that they've heard for so long. Um, within that group of women, I think now we're all um, at senior level positions. That was 10 years ago that we met, and we're all striving to still keep in touch with each other. And so that's that uplifting and that empowerment. So making sure when you meet folks within certain networks that you continue to stay connected. If you hear jobs or you hear of opportunities that may fit other folks, let them know. Let them know what's going on. Make sure that you're reaching out and you're communicating and you keep that connective tissue active within your network of folks that you're working with. Um, you know, also with uh, the NCAS, formerly MVP, but Huddle Up, uh, Jeff O'Brien, who runs that program, has been a pivotal part of, of personal, professional growth and development as well, um, making sure that he highlights um, you know, all, all minorities and uh, providing opportunities specifically for women of color has been incredibly helpful um, for me along the way. NCA committees are obviously a really great opportunity to meet other people, meet other women of color, um, and continue to connect and figure out how did you get to where you are? Asking some of those questions, finding out um, what other folks' tricks of the trade were or what their paths were to help them get to where they are to help you try to shape and, and form what it is that you're going to try to do and how you're going to get there. Um, you know, if you ever take a look at the American Athletic Conference, so the conference that UCF is in currently, we have 12 institutions. Out of those 12 institutions, we have eight African American SWAs that sit on our committee. Eight of 12. That is unheard of and a power five or group of five conference. I am so proud to be a part of a group of women who represent minority women in such a powerful way. Whenever we meet as a group, but more powerfully, whenever we meet as a conference with presidents, faculty, athletic reps, all of our coaches, and everyone gets to see that sitting at the table in between the athletic director and the president of the university, at eight of the institutions as well, you will see a woman of color sitting in a position of influence. It's incredibly, incredibly powerful. And it's just, I smile every time that I see it. I think it's a really cool thing, and I'm hoping that it becomes a trend and it's more of the norm instead of the exception. Um, so obviously using that group of women to help guide and, and grow what it is that we're doing. We're, we're very fortunate to be able to have that network of folks within our conference alone. Um, you know, we, we try to do our best in paying it forward as a conference. Because of that, we started our mentorship opportunity. We're at one SWA meeting every year. We bring a mentor with us to the meeting so they can hear and see what we're doing. They have some exposure to um, what kinds of conversations we're having is we're making some decisions based on the behalf of our sports that we sponsor. Uh, so we try to do that by giving back. 
Uh, personally, I, I do my best to make sure that we are giving um, as much credence to all coaches as possible whenever hiring a coach. Um, you know, Danny White is, is really, really big on making sure that in every possible way that we can for a woman's sport, we have a woman coaching the sport. It's a big deal for him to make sure that we make efforts to continue to be diverse and that our student athletes have folks that look like them who are working with and for them. Um, and when I'm on coaching searches and I have an opportunity to be on some of those search committees, always making sure that we have a person of color and that we have a minority on a committee for consideration. And understanding that that person may not get the job, but that they have been exposed to other people. I learned that a lot in our women's basketball search. We had a very diverse group of women who came and women uh, who came to um, interview for our, women's, for our head women's coaching job. And what I loved the most about that and what I took away from it was we had a young African-American woman who um, applied for the job. She was an assistant coach uh, at a university and so this would have been her first opportunity to be a head coach. And while she wasn't quite ready yet to be a head coach, everyone in that room, including the search firm folks, heard her speak, saw her interaction, and said she's going to be a head coach in the very near future. So even offering those opportunities for exposure and for people to be seen by other folks of influence um, is really important as well, making sure that we provide those opportunities for each other. And then every day, we do our best to make sure that our student athletes know what uh, they want to do. We empower them to, to find a, a goal, to find a passion, to find a profession. And then in our office of student athlete welfare and development, it's our job to make sure we're cultivating those opportunities for them. Um, and it's really important for me as the Senior Associate AD and SWA right here at UCF that all of our student athletes do see what they can be. So as Dewan, I believe you said earlier, or maybe it was the other young man, you can't be what you can't see. So every day I try to make a conscious effort to show our student athletes what they can be if they want to do, you know, whatever it is that they want to do. If they want to be an athletic administrator, they can do it. I'm a young African-American woman doing it. It doesn't have to be in our profession, but anything that you want to do, you can do it. You've got to be able to put in the work. You've got to be able to sacrifice a little bit from time to time, but it is very important that there's no dream that's too big to grasp. And so we always try to make sure that we share that with our student athletes and our graduate assistants and anybody who comes through our office. Um, you know, I, I think I've probably taken up more time than I should, um, but I'll, I'll be with this. Um, I'm sitting in front of you today because people took an opportunity to, to say something to me, to speak to me, to ask me questions about who I am and what I wanted to become. And then when they got those answers and when we had we cultivated those relationships, they then continued to take the time to try to lay bricks out for me and open doors that would help provide opportunities professionally and personally. And so those things mean a lot to me and I continue to try to do that for other people. So anytime you have the opportunity as students, anytime that we have the opportunity as staff and coaches and administrators, faculty to be able to do that, we always want to take the time to sit and listen to what you want to do and then try to help you in any way that we can. I can guarantee you'll get a job, but I guarantee that you'll get some exposure and you'll be able to have a conversation. So that's how I, I try to get it forward and, and get back to what we can do. Thank you, Brittany. All for the audience, follow-up questions are given after all the panelists have spoken. Up next is Ms. Jeanette Bolden. Coach Bolden is the head coach for the women's track and field team at UCF. In 2010, she was inducted into the U.S. track and field and cross country. Coaches Association Hall of Fame. In 2008, she was named the U.S. Olympic Women's Head Coach. Also mentioning she was the first coach, she was the first head coach in U.S. history to have an Olympic medal as an athlete. Before coming to UCF, she was the head coach for UCLA, where she led the Bruins to three national championships. Coach Bolden and her family on the famous 27th Street Bakery in Los Angeles. 
an alum of UCLA. She earned a degree in social studies. Please help me welcome Ms. Jeanette Bowden. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to say that my story in track and field is different than most people. See, I was born with asthma, and I still suffer from asthma. At some point, they told me I would grow out of it, but at 53, I look pretty good at 53. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm 56. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Understanding that asthma and gold medal does not go together. Understanding that when I was born, I was born with club feet, so I wore braces on my legs till I was around two, so I was delayed in walking. That doesn't go on the same line of someone winning a gold medal. And that just goes to show you that hard work is what it takes. I did not allow the things that I've gone through to influence where I am now. I was born in Compton, California. My, my mother was an extremely hard worker. My grandparents were one of the few African Americans that owned a business. So the bakery that we own, I'm third generation of this bakery. So understanding that hard work got me to where I am now. No one in my family was athletic. My mother didn't know anything about track and field at all. She went to a track meet my first state championship, and if you know anything about track and field, I won the prelims, and I think I ran a time of, let's just say, 11-8. Good, I won. Two weeks later, crushed everybody, ran 11 and 4. My mother's like, my baby, you're getting slower. What's wrong? You're getting slower. <laughs> right? I'm not getting slower. I'm getting faster. She didn't understand. But she taught me the value of hard work. When I was younger, my asthma was so severe that I was taken out of my home in Compton, California, and placed in an asthmatic home. It's called Sun Air Home, Sun Air home for Asthmatic Children. They did not cure me of my asthma, but what they did was they taught everyone there to take responsibility of what's going on with you, and they, learned, they taught you how to deal with it. So between my parents and the asthmatic home, I learned that my afflictions were not going to stop me in doing anything I wanted to. So when I left the home and came back to Compton, my, my younger sister wanted to run track. So we went to a park, and while there, I just kind of, hey, would you mind if I run? And the coach was like, if you, if you want to run, that's fine. I said, but I have asthma. He said, that's okay. And uh, I said, this is my inhaler. Me on the floor, inhaler, that kid carry. So I had my inhaler, and I put it in my sock. So I'm jogging it naturally. I put it in the sock, it's going to pop out. Popped out of my sock. And now this little boy is running around spraying my asthmatic, my, my medication all in the air. I'm like, oh my God. He's like, well, you need to go get your inhaler. I said, well, I can't go get my inhaler. He said, you need to go get your inhaler. So I didn't go get it. My sister went. She, my sister's a correction officer, so <laughs> <laughs> to this day, she started back then. But she's like, Jeanette, you need to go get this. I said, but I don't want to. Well, I'm going to go get it. I said, well, you can't go home and tell mom that she's fighting for me. So with pushing up my younger sister, I got my asthmatic inhaler. And you know what it taught me? That no one can do anything to you unless you allow them to. And that was the biggest lesson I learned then, and that's what I, has taken me throughout my career. I've been extremely blessed throughout my athletic career. One state as a high school athlete, went on, um, um, transferred to UCLA, went to UCLA. Uh, I was one of the first, our team was one of the first teams to win NCAA title. Now, we're talking about in the 80s. Now, prior to us winning in uh, 1982, women were um, not part of the NCAA, but AIAW. It was separate, AIAW. So now, my school at UCLA, we won the first two championships of NCAA. Extremely happy. I mean, proud, everything. My idea was to go into social work. But it was a conflict of interest because my last year, 
what happened to be, my first year of graduate school happened to be the year of training for the 1984 Olympic Games. So do I train for the Olympic Games or do I go to graduate school? Part of graduate school, I had to do field work. I chose the Olympic Games. I won a gold medal in the Olympic Games in Los Angeles, went on to a very good career in track and field. Um, somewhere around the mid-90s, my coach, Bob Kersey, who was a coach at UCLA at the time, if you know anything about the last Olympic Games, Allison T was a very accomplished athlete. Was coached by Bob Kersey, my former coach. One of my best friends, Jackie Joyner Kersey, Bobby's wife. And while I was at UCLA, again, remember I said I transferred to UCLA. When I got there, the women's team were not allowed to train with the men's team. Now understand, I grew up in a household of my parents, like, you can do anything you want to. I left that magic home saying, look, you guys can do anything you want to. Now I walk into UCLA and like, well, no, you can't train with the men. Like, why? Well, you can't. They take athletics real serious. I said, wait a minute. I, we kind of take athletics, athletics very serious. So the coach, if you know anything about Bob Kersey, he's not one to, take, to back down of anything. He was a big advocate for women, especially women of color. And he just said, look, either you allow them to train at the exact same time, or they're all leaving. Remember, we can going win a national championship. So they devised a way where even to this day, there's two marks on both sides of the track. So the women train at the same exact time as the men. We just use the other side of the track. So understand that in my DNA, I've always been someone to never take no for an answer because my family's always taught me that if you work hard, you can do anything you want to. So that's always been my mentality as an athlete, going on as a coach, understanding that if you want to do something, just work hard. As I moved on throughout my, my athletic career, Bob Kersey was, was telling me, well, Jeanette, maybe you should help volunteer as a coach. So I started volunteering as a coach at UCLA. Then I moved on to restricted earnings, which means you didn't really make that much money anyway. But I, but I had other things that I was doing. I was, I was a motivational speaker and I worked for the Asthma and Allergy Foundation. So I was okay. Then he said, uh, I think at some point I'm going to allow you to be the assistant coach. So I moved into being an assistant coach. And I did everything from taking care of the budget, to cleaning up the shed, to washing clothes, to taking care of equivalencies, who's getting scholarships, going on to home visits, where you're convincing a young person to come to your school. I did any and everything. And got to the point, I was right when I was getting frustrated, like, wait a minute, I'm doing everything as a head coach, but I'm not getting recognized as a head coach. But understanding that he's mentoring me the, in the whole entire time. My um, athletic director, senior women's administrator, was Dr. Judith Holland. And her thought was, you just need to win. You have to win. As a female coach, you need to win. Her male coaches needed to win. But understanding that, Jeanette, you need to win. And that's all she kept saying to me as an assistant coach. The time came, it was really spur of the moment. But I was like, Jeanette, I think you should be head coach now. No preparation, no long conversation, like, let's, you're going to be this now. He went into the staff meeting, the, the program was divided, men and women, and said, uh, Jeanette's going to be the, the head coach of the women's team. Two coaches on the staff immediately said what? Well, she's going to what, get us, take notes at the meeting, or she's going to get us coffee? They actually said the word coffee. Like, are you kidding me? Understand, I came from a pro, I came from a family that hard work, you can do any and everything you wanted to. I let the coffee thing slide, okay? <laughs> Moving on, we go, to, we go to a conference championship, my first conference championship. The men's coach takes me around, well, you need to do this, sign this paper, sign this paper, do these things. The men's team won conference, the women's team won conference. 
So now you take me into a building where I need to sign some paperwork for my kids to go on to NCAA. Walk inside to this day. I know the coach's name. I know how he looks. Walk into the building. He congratulated my male counterpart. He congratulated him on another conference championship. And he's high-fiving them and everything. And did not one time acknowledge me. Not once. Did I go and cry? No. I just put him down on my checklist and made sure that his team would never, ever, ever beat my team. And they didn't. <laughs> That's why I got my revenge. Couldn't really say anything. At least not at that time. That was like, like 18 years ago. Now, today, the Jeanette Baller today, no, he wouldn't get away with that too much. So I ran into my, my ball, so. <laughs> But understand, as a young coach, a young female coach, one of few women and a very small group of African American women, very, very small group, there's only a little over 283 Division I track and field programs. A very small group are female coaches. Even smaller group, head coaches. So I'm, I'm walking to rooms and I don't see anyone that looks like me. I go to a national championship. We just won a conference. So I had to get that thought of my, out of my mind that this coach did not even say anything to me. We go to a national championship. And I never will forget, the coach at that time was Bev Kearney, the coach at the University of Texas. And she said, she introduced herself to me and she said, Jeanette, are you the interim coach or are you the coach? I said, I'm the coach, I'm the one. She said, I'm glad you said it, because a lot of these men want to go and apply for the UCLA job. I said, it says that I'm head coach. I don't know what to say to people. But then my action spoke a lot more than what I could say. I rattled off 10 conference championships, and then I, I skipped a year, and then won another. I rattled off 10 conference championships. In the Pac-10, now the Pac-12. Then I turned around and won three NCAA championships. There's only been three women in Division One track and field that won national championships. Two of them do not coach anymore, at least in a head coach position. I'm the only one. And I say that not to brag, not, not to boast, but to let you know that hard work means a lot, but at the same time, you have to be very, very confident of what you're doing. And I have been, and I've learned to be that way in athletics as a coach because of my hard work as an athlete. I've had mentors along the way, and a lot of them have been men. Like I said, Bob Percy, my, my mentor, gave me a lot of advice as a coach. Uh, Dr. Judah Pollard gave me a lot of advice. As, as, as an athletic director. Bev Kearney, Karen Dennis is at the, uh, Ohio State right now. Very few women in my position, but at the same time, they, they put their arms around me and they told me these are the things you need to do. One of my best friends is Jackie Jonah Kersey. And Jackie taught me, Jeanette, you just have to go out there and do your best. Never burn any bridges, but do your best. That's what I've learned as one of the most accomplished athletes of our modern day time, Jackie Joan Kersey. She's not, she's, not coach, she's not coaching at this position, and she's not an administrator. But the words carry on. You have to do your best. You don't burn any bridges. And the person, the coach that I am now is different than the coach I was back then. The X's and O's are the same. Knowing what you're doing is the same. But your attitude and what I bring to the table is a lot different. One of the biggest challenges of being a coach actually comes from your female athlete. Actually comes from the female athlete. In the beginning, it was more of, I could say something, and Bob Percy could say something. We can say the exact same thing. We can give the exact same instructions. Run this 100 meters 
and, 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 and work on these things. Or why are you late today for practice? This is what you need to do to practice. And believe me, the biggest attitude would come from the female athlete. They would do exactly what the male coach would say without any problem. If I said something, it was my, well, why is she saying that to me? She must have an attitude. What's wrong with her today? Why is she being so mean to me? Are you kidding me? The male, now believe me, the male coach says the exact same thing. Uses words that I probably can't say right now. <laughs> the female coach will say the exact same thing, put a different spin on it, and all of a sudden, what's wrong with it? And there's that in line the problem. A lot of that is because there are not enough female coaches, even in the high school level, the junior high school level. So you don't really understand. And maybe the person of authority may have been your mother, but you see your mother in, in a different light. So I, every year I have to keep telling my students, ladies, I coach the athlete. I don't coach the gender. So I will use words to my male athletes just like I will use words to my female athletes. And all the athletes that I've coached in all my years, over 23 years, they'll tell you one thing. Coach Bowden is mean and she's hard. If I coach men, which I did for a couple of years, they'll never say that. You're getting that. Let me know how long that kiss me. Oh my God. <laughs> See, that's when my athletes here say yes, Coach Bowden. <laughs> Understand that you have to continue to work hard, no matter what you do. And you have to have a self-presence about you. Because if somebody sense weakness, there you go right there. Let me leave on this note. If I was talking to myself 15, 20 years ago, I may or may not still be a coach. I probably would have told myself, look, you've won a couple of national championships, now let's move into athletic administration because you have the heart, you have the desire, and you have the work ethic. Having said that, thank you guys.